Okay, this will be the next Bible Institute lesson. We've made it to the Abrahamic Covenant, so we're going to look at the Abrahamic Covenant and the Dispensation of Promise. Now here's some quick details for the Abrahamic Covenant. Who's the main characters we're going to be looking at in this scene? That will be Abraham, his wife Sarah, and of course Abraham, his name was Abram before the Lord changed it to Abraham. Sarah, her name was Sarai before the Lord changed it to Sarah. And then you got their son Isaac and his son Jacob. And then Jacob's sons, which will be the 12 tribes. The name of the covenant is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, what's the purpose of the covenant? Well, God is going to call out Abraham and promise to bless or curse through Abraham and his family. Genesis 12, 3. Number two, Abraham and his descendants are given a land grant in this covenant. Number three, Abraham is promised that his seed will be as the stars of heaven and the dust of the earth. What's the token or sign or symbol of this covenant? It's circumcision. That's Genesis 17, 11 and Romans 4, 11. What is the Lord Jesus Christ seen as? He's seen as the promised seed. Abraham has promised a seed that will eventually be Jesus Christ. Abraham sacrificing Isaac pictures the father sacrificing the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 22. Okay, so that's the Abrahamic covenant. And it did not just do away with the Adamic and Noahic covenant because you know, the Gentile world still operated under those covenants. The Abrahamic covenant was primarily to, for the Hebrew race. Okay, what is the dispensation that we're going to look at? The dispensation is the dispensation of promise. Because of the promise God makes with Abraham. And look at Hebrews 6.15. Hebrews 11.9. And Hebrews 6.15. It says, And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. All right, now... Hebrews 11.9 By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So that's why most people call it the dispensation of promise. Because of the promise that God makes with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the twelve tribes. Now who's the steward? Obviously, Abraham. Okay, what about his kingship? Well, in Isaiah 41 and verse 2, it says, Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. So, Abraham... Considered a king by the Lord. He's getting the crown. You know, Adam had the crown. He had dominion. God gave him dominion over the fish of the sea and over fowl of the air. Genesis 1.28. Noah got off the ark. He was the only man. He was the head of his house. And the only family. So, he was king. Now we see that Abraham considered a king here made him rule over kings in Isaiah 41, 2. And for the first time, the king, the king keeping the crown, isn't dependent on his conduct. This kingship has been established by grace, and the devil can't knock off Abraham's crown. Okay, what's the responsibility? 
and this dispensation is once again sacrificed to God, as you see Abraham do in Genesis 15, 9 through 10. The next thing is physical circumcision. In Genesis 17, 9 through 14, God gives Abraham the sign of circumcision, and that is a responsibility to all of them. The third thing, stay in the land given to him. Genesis, two, uh, Genesis 12, 7. Stay in the land given to him. The fourth thing, believe God about the seed of Abraham being as the dust of the earth and the stars of heaven. That's all they had to do was those things. Just believe what God said. Believe God about the seed of Abraham being as the dust of the earth and stars of heaven. Okay, what's the test? The test is Abraham was tested when he offered up Isaac in Genesis twenty two sixteen through 18. Abraham was tested on his faith and believing the promise that his seed would be as the dust of the earth, as the stars of heaven. And he was tested with the situation with Hagar. So what happened with the situation with Hagar is God had told Abraham that he was going to have a child by his wife, Sarah, they're old and they're in old age, both of them, and they weren't. It wasn't being successful. They weren't having a child. Time was going by, so Sarah's like, "I want you to take my handmaid Hagar and have a child by her, so that we can, you know, have a seed." And Abraham gives in and does that, so he failed the test there, and then he's. Tested again with the offering up of Isaac, which he goes through with, but the Lord stops him from, as soon as that knife comes up, he tells him to stop, but he went through with it. He, he passed that test. And they were also tested on staying in Canaan, the land God gave to him. Okay, now here's the failures in this dispensation. There's a lot of failures. Just as in every dispensation, you've got tests and then you've got failures. Abraham was supposed to get away from his kindred. This was the first failure. He was supposed to get away from his kindred when he, when he uh, went to the land that God wanted him to go to. But he takes Lot, his nephew, with him. And Lot ends up having two sons that would become the Ammonites and Moabites. That's two more thorns in the flesh to Israel. The Ammonites and the Moabites. And number two, Abraham goes to Egypt because of a famine. In Genesis 12.10. He was supposed, remember he was supposed to just stay in the land that God gave to him, but he goes to Egypt. And Egypt in the Bible is always bad. Number three, Abraham takes Hagar to wife, an Egyptian. Hagar is an Egyptian. And like I said, that was because he, they were so worried about that they couldn't have a child together. So he goes in under Hagar and has a child by her, an Egyptian. He then went to Egypt during a famine no, he's going to this Egyptian woman to have a child when he was already told that he was going to have one with Sarah. And he has Ishmael by her. And Ishmael represents the devil's line. And the descendants of Ishmael are a thorn in the flesh to Israel even unto this day. <clears throat> So you see that decision, the decisions he's making is just, the bad decisions he's making is adding enemies to his descendants throughout time. Now, not the next thing, Jacob, Jacob's sons sell their brother and he ends up in Egypt in Genesis 37, 28. Another one of Jacob's sons named Judah 
marries a heathen woman in Genesis 38, 1 through 10. And then Jacob and his sons, his family, they all end up in Egypt in Genesis 46, 5. So there was a lot of failures, a lot of them going to Egypt. Okay, what's the result? Israel ends up in Egypt, not in Canaan, not in the land that God gave to them. They end up in Egypt. However, God sees, saw the future. He saw it, that it was going to happen before it happened. And he used it for his glory, and he used it to just further preserve his plan for them. So, so God preserves them and uses their choices for his plan. While in Egypt, the line stays pure and they don't intermarry. They don't intermarry because it was an abomination with the Egyptians to eat with Hebrews. In Genesis forty-three thirty-two. so by them, you see, Judah was already starting to intermarry with women that weren't in a good line. And that was going to mess everything up. That was going to be an attack on the seed by the devil. If he could get them to intermarry with all those heathen women. And then, you know, he brings that famine. And they have to go to Egypt to get food. And God saw through his foreknowledge that that famine was going to come. So when Joseph was sold, he has him end up in Egypt where he was able to get all that food for him. So... God sees it. God sees into the future with his foreknowledge. And he preserves Israel throughout all this. Okay, what's the judgment? Is Israel ends up in bondage in Egypt. That's Exodus 1.14, Genesis 15.13. And when he's telling Abraham about the things he's given to him as a promise, he even tells him that, that they're going to end up in bondage in Egypt. His seed for 430 years even okay what's the length of time of this dispensation around 430 years beginning when abram is called out of his homeland genesis 12 1 and then ending when god gives israel the law after deli delivering them from egypt in exodus 20 so there's still not a written word of god that people carry around God appeared to Abraham in dreams and visions and even as the angel of the Lord. Also, remember that people would have understood about God because it's not that long since the flood. When Abraham was around, it hadn't been that long since the flood of Noah. Noah hadn't been dead long and Shem was actually still alive when Abraham was alive. Shem is one of Noah's sons that was on the ark. So when Abraham is alive, you have Shem alive who could have told him all about, could have told people all about the ark, could have told him all about what the world was like before the ark. And Noah also would have knew men who lived when Adam was alive. As Noah himself was born 120 to 130 years after Adam's death. So, you're going to have great truths about God and what he's done passed down. And, and the people are going to know truths about the flood and the world before the flood that we might not even know about right now. So keep that in mind. God hasn't just left people in the dark about him and his power during this time. Also consider how Abram, Abraham is called out of Ur of the Chaldees. That's where he's called out, and that's Babylon. Abram was called out of idolatry. You know, his father was an idolater there in Babylon. And in Joshua 24, 2, it says, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Abraham was caught out of Babylon, caught out of this idol worship. 
And Abram would have seen and heard how God confounded the languages there. The signs of an almighty God being in existence were in front of people's faces. They were operating much more by sight in that sense. And during these days of Abraham, or the dispensation of Abraham, you're going to see a very important thing. You're going to see that God's line develops into the nation of Israel. You know, we've been looking at lines. You know, you had, the, you had Abel and you had Cain. Abel representing the good line. Cain representing the devil's line because he's of that wicked one. Cain kills Abel, but then God brings Seth to Adam and Eve. They have Seth. He's going to represent the Lord's line. And then eventually it'll go into Shem. And then from Shem, eventually will come Abraham. So, that's what you see. And God's going to develop his line into the nation of Israel. That's a really important thing. Don't just let that go in one ear and not the other. He's developing his line to the nation of Israel. And what you have with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the formulation of the nation of Israel. So the seed has come through Adam, Seth, Noah, Shem. Now it's going to come through Abraham and his descendants. Abraham has a son named Isaac, who has a son named Jacob. And then Jacob has 12 sons, which will make up the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. If you've been in church or around the Bible any amount of time, you've heard of the 12 tribes of Israel. You've heard of, you know, Judah and Naphtali and Joseph and all them. And I know you've heard them. Don't let this go in one ear and out the other. This is real important to understand about God and the nation of Israel. Since God's object of dealing is going to be with this nation of Israel and the promised seed is coming through them, the devil's crosshairs are going to be on destroying Israel. And that's where they've always been. He wants to destroy Israel. He hates Israel. So we saw all Noah's descendants failed to spread out. Remember that? He told Noah and, and his three sons, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. They were supposed to overspread the whole earth, yet they all joined together to build the Tower of Babel. And God came down, confounded their language, and scattered them. Now, I'm sure that Noah's sons, they were fruitful and multiplied. And obviously they had to have been because or nobody would be here. But... Most likely, Noah and his three sons, they were going through with that plan to overspread the whole earth. But eventually, man got more wicked and wicked once again, and they got together, and they began to build that Tower of Babel. And out of, out of all that mess with the Tower of Babel, people gathering together, making like a one-world government against God, out of all that mess, God had a man that he called out, and he calls out a man named Abram. And that brings us to this great scene in the Bible. You could call it the calling out of the nation of Israel. And Abram will be the first Jew. Abram is Abraham. He called him Abram before he was Abraham. Noah was the father of the Gentiles. Abraham is the father of the Jews. He's the first Jew. Now let's look at Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 4. It says, Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So here's the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. Look at what he said. The Lord is going to make of him a great nation. Bless him. Make his name great. And he will be a blessing. And he will bless them that bless him and curse him that curseth him. In him shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God is going to form a nation starting with this man, Abraham. 
and you really need to get this, the rest of the Old Testament will be about the seed of Abraham. The Gospels are about the Jews. And in the church age, in Pauline epistles, the Apostle Paul, a Jew, ministers to the Gentiles. But then after the rapture, the Lord once again goes back to dealing with the Jews once again. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob being the grandson of Abraham. So, when it comes to Abraham, the Bible calls him Abram, the Hebrew, because he comes from Eber, a man named Eber. In Genesis 14, 13, it says, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew. So Abraham is a Hebrew. And that's because he came from this man named Eber. In Genesis 10, 21, it says, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born, it says in Genesis 10, 21. So Abraham is the first Jew. He is Abram the Hebrew. And he is the one who God called out to be the father of this nation that was going to be the new object of God's dealing. And in Genesis 11, 10 through 26, it shows you that Abram is in the line of Shem and Eber. The Jews came from Shem. And this is why people call Jew, -hater, Jew haters anti-Semitic. And during Abram's time, so far they are called Hebrews. Later, they're going to be called Israel. Because in Genesis 32, 28, Jacob, grandson of Abraham, is the father of the 12 tribes, and Jacob is renamed to Israel. And the name eventually will refer to Jacob's descendants as a whole. And they are called Jews for the first time in 2 Kings 16, 6. And this comes from the fact that the kingdom of Israel is split in two with ten northern tribes and two southern tribes, the southern kingdom is referred to as Judah because it was made up of Judah and Benjamin, and eventually that shortened down to just Jew. Judah shortened down to Jew, and then eventually was referred, used to refer to all the what we know as Jews. So, <clears throat> Abraham is a Hebrew. They're also called Israel. They're also called Jews. And in Genesis 15 is where Abraham is counted righteous. Abraham got out of Babylon, did as the Lord told him to do, messed up a little bit because he took a lot with him. He was supposed to leave him behind. And then you get to Genesis 15, and this is where Abraham is counted righteous. In Genesis 15, 1, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Notice that phrase. What wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. Notice that phrase, though. Abraham says, What wilt thou give me? He knew this would have to be a miracle. He knew that for him to have children, it's going to be a miracle of God because he's too old. And it couldn't be done on his own. And it says, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come, out, come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars... Like, count them, count the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So he takes Abraham out there on a starry night, a dark starry night, has him look up, and he says, If you can count all those stars, that's how much your seed is going to be. Just innumerable, like those stars. And Abraham believes God that he's going to give him a son, and then an innumerable amount of people will come from 
the, all those children he's going to have. This is such a great thing for Abraham to believe because Abraham and his wife are already so old. So it's an amazing thing that Abraham believes. This promise to Abraham will see complete fulfillment in the millennium and on out into eternity. In the millennium, Israel will have the land promised to them with peace on every side, with Jesus Christ reigning physically from a throne in Jerusalem. And all the way out into eternity, there will still be children being born of the seed of Abraham. God's going to keep his promise. Because it says in Isaiah chapter 9, of the increase of his government and kingdom, there shall be no end. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This is talking about the Lord Jesus. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. <clears throat> so, there's going to be no end to his kingdom. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. It's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Abraham not only will have a physical seed as the dust of the earth, but also a spiritual seed that is innumerable as the stars. And as a born-again believer, you are also Abraham's seed spiritually. You today, as a born-again believer who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a spiritual seed of Abraham. You don't replace the Jew but you get in on the promises. You've been grafted in, as Paul talks about in the book of Romans. It says in Galatians 3, 6 through 7, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. If you believed on Jesus Christ, then you are of the spiritual seed of Abraham. It says in Galatians 3, 8, 9, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That was the gospel that was preached to Abraham. That was the good news that God gave to Abraham was, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. And in Galatians 3.29, And if ye be Christ's, if you're saved, you are, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you get in on the promise by faith. Even though you're not a Jew physically, you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you became a part of the spiritual seed of Abraham, and you get in on the promises. Jesus Christ is the promised seed. When God manifested himself in the flesh, he was made of the seed of Abraham. And in Galatians 3.16, it says, Not a Abraham and his seed... Where the promise is made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Jesus Christ is the promised seed. You got in Christ when you got saved, so therefore you get in on the promises. Hebrews 2.16, it says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, this is talking about the Lord Jesus, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So when I got born again and was placed in the body of Christ, I became one of Abraham's spiritual seed. Now here's to describe to you some differences between Abraham's earthly seed and Abraham's spiritual seed. Abraham's earthly seed, well, that's Israel. Abraham's spiritual seed is Jew and Gentiles that are in the body of Christ, as it says in Galatians 3.29. When it comes to his earthly seed, his earthly seed has an earthly inheritance in the land of Palestine. When it comes to his spiritual seed, they have a heavenly inheritance, and they'll also reign with Jesus on the earth in the millennium. When it comes to Abraham's earthly seed, they got an unconditional covenant that assures them 
of being restored. Right now, they God's put them away for right now, but they're going to be restored in the future. When it comes to Abraham's spiritual seed, we also have something that's unconditional, an unconditional covenant, because our salvation is eternally secure. The moment we believe the gospel, we were born again to the family of God, nothing can take that away. When it comes to Abraham's earthly seed, they will have the earthly Jerusalem. When it comes to Abraham's spiritual seed, we will have the new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. So there's some differences between Abraham's earthly seed and Abraham's spiritual seed. Abraham believed God about what he promised him in Genesis 15, and that is the amazing thing. Imagine if you were that old and the Lord promised you a baby and your wife was also not that much younger than you and she is promised to have a baby by you. And it says in Genesis 15, 6 through 7, talking about Abraham, and he believed in the Lord. This was about his seed. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So Abraham got imputed righteousness for believing God about his seed. He got righteousness way before he ever offered up Isaac on the altar. Even before he was given the sign of circumcision, he was given righteousness. And that's a key to remember. Because in the New Testament, a lot of guys are going around saying that you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. So Paul uses the illustration of Abraham getting righteousness before he's circumcised to illustrate the great truth that me and you are saved by grace through faith without any type of works, without physical circumcision, without water baptism, without living a good life, without all these other things that people want to add to the gospel. And in Genesis 15, 8 through 9, it says, And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He's like, how do I know that I'm, I'm going to inherit it? This is Abraham talking. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. The sacrifices that you're going to see picture the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Notice the continual mention of three years old, which could picture the Lord's three-and-a-half-year ministry. Notice he takes an heifer. Israel eventually backslides as a backsliding heifer in Hosea 4.16. And what you're going to see is these sacrifices here picture the Lord Jesus Christ who became sin. The Lord Jesus Christ became sin on the cross. He became your backsliding. He became every wicked thing that everybody's ever done when he was on the cross. And he was made an offering for sin, just like these animals. So he has him take a heifer, what's Israel referred to, a backsliding heifer in Hosea 4.16. He has him take a goat. The goat had to do with a sin offering in the Bible. And you know what? Jesus Christ was made sin for us. He made him to be sin when he was on the cross. He also tells him to take a ram. The Bible talks about a ram of consecration. Consecration means someone, some, uh, consecration separates someone from a common to a sacred use, just as Jesus was. And a, a ram is a full-grown male sheep. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was a full-grown male. In Genesis 22, Abraham offers a ram that's caught in a thicket. This pictures Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, a full-grown male. And those thickets picture that crown of thorns that Jesus wears when he's on the cross. And that shows that he's taking the curse for us. Because the thorns and thickets, that's part of the curse that Adam brought into the world. So the ram pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Genesis 15, 10, it, talking about Abraham, it says, And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls come down, when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. 
So once again, we see fowls, birds, showing up picturing unclean spirits, but Abraham drives them away. When you were lost, the devil and unclean spirits would try to steal away the word that had been sown in your heart. But if you got saved, you drove them away and you believed the gospel anyway. You didn't let them take the word out of your heart. You believed it. And Genesis 15, 12, and 13, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a strange land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. That's a prophecy of them being in bondage in Egypt. This pictures the Jews going through the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. Genesis 15, 14. It says, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. There is that land grant that God is giving Abraham in this covenant. Remember that Abraham said at the beginning of chapter 15, he said, What wilt thou give me? showing he knew this had to be from the Lord, just like our salvation. When you got saved, God gave you that salvation. Then later on, what does Abraham ask? He asks, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? God gave Abraham a land, and he said, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Then the Lord has him make a sacrifice, and those sacrifices point to Jesus Christ. So when you ask the Lord yourself, what would thou give me? Remember, what did he give you? He gave you salvation when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then later on you said, you know, how do I know I'm saved? And what does he do? He just points you right back to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what this picture is in Genesis 15. If you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, then you're in and you can know that you're saved. But now I want to also take you to Romans chapter 4 and show you what it says about Abraham. Romans 4, 1, it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So he could glory before men, but he couldn't glory before God. Men can see your outward works. God sees the heart. It says, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And that's in Genesis 15, when he believed God about his seed. It says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you earn salvation, then God would have been in debt to you. You got it by grace. He's given you something that you don't deserve. So he says in Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, your salvation has nothing to do with your works. The moment you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you got righteousness. Just like the moment Abraham believed God about his seed, he was counted righteous. But we got a lot of things even greater than what Abraham had. He didn't have, when it comes to his righteousness, it was not the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that we have today. It says in verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Imputation not only has to do with God putting righteousness on your record, but also with him not applying your unrighteousness to your record anymore. He says in Romans 4, 9, and 10, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the circum uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. 
How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. You see how that Abraham was counted righteous before he was ever circumcised. He was counted righteous because he believed God about his seed. This pictures how me and you are saved by faith before we do any kind of outward work. In Romans 4.11, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. If you believed on Jesus Christ, you are of the spiritual seed of Abraham, Though you be not circumcised, though you be not a physical Jew, you are a child of God by faith. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Notice it plainly tells you in Romans 4 what Abraham had his, his faith in. In Romans 4.18, it says, talking about Abraham, it says, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Abraham believed God that he was going to become a father of many nations. It says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Just as Abraham believed God that he was going to have a son in his old age, it was counted to him for righteousness. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that he was raised from the dead and he's our justification. We get righteousness for believing on Jesus Christ. Abraham got righteousness for believing God about his seed. We get righteousness for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we get is greater because we get the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Both Abraham and us get righteousness by faith, but the faith was in different things. So remember that the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. It was not only to Abraham, but also to Isaac and Jacob, the 12 tribes, and the believing remnant of Israel. Psalm 105, 8 through 10. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. This covenant is to all the 12 tribes. For this reason, the devil hates the Jews. He hates them because they got his land. He hates them because of the promised seed. So everyone is led to being anti-Semitic. Christians are led into replacement theology, teaching that the church has replaced Israel when it hasn't. And the world's jealousy over the Jews will eventually lead to the battle of Armageddon. Look at Psalm 83. Psalm 83, it says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. And they, hate, they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, Israel. That's who that, thy people is. Thy people is Israel. And consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the hagar Enins, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre 
Asher also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot, Selah, doing to them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook Kison, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. Yea, all their princes of Zeba and as Zalmunna, who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind. As the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek the name, thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. You see that? How that wanting to cut off Israel is eventually going to lead to Armageddon, where he's going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance. And even though in this present day the Jews are blind to the gospel of Jesus Christ, there will still be a believing remnant in the tribulation, and Jesus Christ will come down at the second coming and fight for Israel in a physical land. It talks about in Romans 11, 25 through 26, it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. All the nations are going to come up against Jesus Christ and Israel, and he's going to wipe them out at the second coming. And Israel will become the ruling nation with Jesus Christ himself sitting on the throne as king.